Um, well, I guess we'll just slowly start doing introductions. I'll say a little bit and then Jake's gonna say something and then I will introduce, um, I'll introduce you, Anne. So welcome everyone to another Friends from the Field webinar. If you haven't joined us before, these webinars have been happening since the end of April, kind of in response to COVID and the lockdown as a way for us to continue to stay connected and share knowledge, um, even if through a, a virtual arena. Um, and this series is co-hosted by Blue Hill Heritage Trust, which is a community conservation organization on the Blue Hill Peninsula, and Island Heritage Trust, which is a land trust for Deer Isle, Stonington, and the surrounding islands. Um, and my name's Lander, and I'm the outreach coordinator for Blue Hill Heritage Trust. Um, and then I just want to say thank you to everyone in the community who supports our free programming. Um, we're so grateful for that and to be able to offer these types of events. And if you have any interest in contributing to this ongoing work, there are ways on both Blue Heritage Trust website and the Island Heritage Trust website. And now I'm going to pass it to Jake for a moment for some technology housekeeping. Thanks, Lander. So uh, one of the most important things I'll I'll point out to you all is the chat feature uh, at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions for Anne, you can submit your chats there and, and Lander and I will kind of fish through them and weed through them and uh, go in the best as we can in the order that they are delivered. And at the end, if you feel like tuning in with your audio or even maybe with your video, if you have the capability, you can ask Anne your questions directly and um, Lander will be monitoring that and assisting you with that at the end of the presentation. If you want to ask your questions throughout the presentation, you can, but I think just for this, you know, to keep flow, we won't interrupt Anne and we'll save them for the end. But like I said, we'll do our best to go through all of them and, and uh, we'll tune in maybe the last 10 or 15 minutes of the presentation. I'll hand it back over to Lander and she can do a formal introduction. Thanks so much, Jake. So we're so excited to have Anne with us today. Um, Anne Pollardranko has been a professional artist since the age of 13. She began her career as a jeweler, collecting discarded pieces of pottery and glass from the banks of the Penobscot River and watershed, and turning them into wearable pieces of jewelry. Last year, she began painting and has found that through a mixed media approach, art offers a vehicle to discuss broader topics that are not often bridged. Her work is represented in the Abbey Museum and at various art shows throughout the state. So Anne, thank you so much for being here today with us. We're all very excited to have you. Thank you so much for having me and thank you so much everybody who's tuned in. I'm so excited to share this virtual space with you all. So I'm really appreciative. So thank you so much for the introduction and let's get started. So I'm going to begin just by showing you all a video that I have put together. It's a very, very short video to sort of set the mind frame for how I approach my artwork and views about land conservation and just my passion for my Penobscot homeland. So, and I apologize if the video quality isn't as pristine as it looks on my end when I created the video. Um, there are some technical difficulties, but let's hope that all goes well. So, get started. Many people describe Penobscot Bay and surrounding coastal areas as having a timeless feel. But to me, time is everything. Time is 15,000 years of my ancestors cherishing these places and taking care of these places as they take care of us. To me, time is the future. Time is a promise to do everything that I can to help protect this beautiful homeland for future generations to come and all of my relations. Time is everything. So I'm just going to get the keynote presentation. So Lander did a great job of introducing the concept of indigenous art and environmentalism playing a really important role in the future of land conservation movements in Maine and throughout Turtle Island. So of course, coming from the Penobscot tribe, this homeland is so dear to my heart and all these areas that I hope many of you have had the opportunity to visit have just been cherished by my ancestors for thousands and thousands of years. 
So I believe this gives me a unique understanding and connection with this homeland. I'm from the Penobscot Nation, and currently our reservation is a very, very small island in the Penobscot River. And if you can see on the right-hand image, the little pin drop is where the island reservation is. And but yes, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I'm absolutely seeing the, um, the the video picture. Oh, you are. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, thank you so much for letting me know. On my screen, it looks a bit different. So let me let me try stop screen sharing. I'll restart screen sharing, and hopefully you'll be able to see what I can see. Sorry about that, everybody. That's okay. Well, hopefully this will make a lot more sense. <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, so does that look good on your Islander? It looks great. Okay, fabulous, fabulous. All right, so let me just get back to you. So this is our flag for the Penobscot Nation. Um, the different crosses stand for purity, faith, and valor, which were all sort of like tenants um, and kind of speak to our relationship with the church at the beginning of the, you know, I guess an alliance of sorts. On the left image that you can see, the dots represent the different um, reservations in the state of Maine. So we have Indian Island, which is for the Penobscot tribe, both Pleasant Point and Indian Township are for the Passamaquoddy tribe, and Holton and Presque Isle are Micmac. And the next images that I'll be showing you, and Maliseet as well, the next images that I'm showing you are traditional territories that would have been very flexible borders, um, so they wouldn't be cut in stone like modern day country borders. So the Abenaki, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Micmac all shared the, our, what we now know as Maine. And um, Penobscot homeland was reduced upon colonization to a tiny pin drop island like I was showing you. Now you can see in the photograph that it's a very, very, very small island in the Penobscot River. But this is a very quick, you know, history took a lot of time. There was genocide. Thousands and thousands and thousands of my ancestors were killed through uh, bounty hunting, through disease, and, and just going hungry because we lost our ability to access places that would have been traditionally hunted or traditionally fished or gathered on and over the decades and, and approaching the modern times the access for our tribe to places along the coast has been nearly uh, completely quelled because places like Mount Desert Island which was a traditional gathering place for the Penobscot people and other tribes is now pretty much restricted access um, through private property ownership. So this just really alerts you know everybody to the uh, this idea of access and and why is access important not only for indigenous people but for you know all of us who, who wish to enjoy this beautiful homeland that has been taken care of by the Wabanaki peoples for thousands of years um, as a young child I always was picking up you know discarded pieces of pottery or glass that I found along the the riverbanks and throughout the coastal areas. And at the age of 13, I wanted to start to share my voice and to talk about how you can turn something that is trash into a talking piece, um, which would translate to discussions about environmental protection and taking care of this homeland. So taking these pieces of trash, essentially, I was able to to develop some sea glass and wire wrapping techniques as well as just ways to sand down the edges of the pottery and sea glass so it wouldn't be abrasive. And it was really, really remarkable to have an outlet at 13 years of age to be selling my work uh, throughout the summertime and uh, really developed a great relationship with the Abbey Museum who to this day carry my work and have supported me these 13 years as an artist. and. It's really outstanding and I'm so thankful for these opportunities and this will be a recurring theme opportunities for indigenous people to have a voice and to carry on these traditions um, I come from a very 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 long line of basket makers and artisans and to be able in this day and age to have a new take on these traditions and sharing this knowledge in a respectful way is really something that I'm very passionate about in terms of my evolution of art, I love watercolor, working with watercolors, and I think it's a great way to be able to 
articulate in, a, in, a, in an image form this passion and, and this culture that is within me and just really wanting to share with, with everybody else. So you might see an image or a motif that you're unfamiliar with. The Wabanaki double curve, which you can see throughout these images, is a double curve representing equality and balance within nature and relationships with nature. Traditionally, the double curve would have depicted medicinal plants and other important symbols, but I like to have a, a different approach in terms of sharing with a wider audience and have an, my own interpretation throughout my watercolors. I'll show you a few more images. And this is a great horned owl and a raven at home. And I've always had a really special connection with Harbor Seals since I was a child. Um, one of the preserves before it was in, in preserve um, belonged to a Machias Port landowner, which is now a Maine Coast Heritage Trust Preserve. But as a toddler, I'd visit the beach and petroglyphs and, and stay there with my family. And on one particular occasion, a baby harbor seal came on shore and followed me around for hours and hours. And it was just, just the best memory ever. And um, eventually, Mama came and, and called her pup in <laughs> into the water. And, and there, here she went. But that's been an everlasting memory. So seals have been so important to me and I've had a really strong connection with them. And recently I found out that my, I'm a direct descendant of Chief Orono. Um, I recently found out that his signature is a seal. So it's something that has been a cherished, you know, symbol and an animal that has been cherished for many, many, many years. And of course, ospreys. Who doesn't love watching ospreys fish in the bay? It's one of the most incredible, incredible sights really. In this uh, quarantine time, I have really expanded my interests in art and just trying out different things. I love um, digital art and I've decided that I'd really like to attempt to convey some of these messages about the ancestral connectivity to our homeland using you know, a more modern approach that may appeal to some of the younger generations that um, may not have as much of an appreciation for traditional art. So this is, uh, these are a few images from my series, uh, Our Ancestors Are Always With Us. Um, just a few images. And I wanted to just uh, turn the page now and talk a little bit about how land trusts um, have been doing really, really incredible work, um, both Blue Hill Heritage Trust and the Island Heritage Trust for over 30 years have worked really, really hard to conserve um, thousands of acres of land. Um, Blue Hill Heritage Trust has preserved 10,000 acres throughout Blue Hill and the surrounding areas, and Island Heritage Trust has conserved 771 acres, and I believe they um, control 18 properties as well. And this is just truly incredible and a very, um, it's a glimpse in this land conservation movement that has been going on for you know, a few decades now. And in total, land trust organizations own about 1 million acres of land throughout the state of Maine. And this arises some questions about how moving forward, we can really work together to incorporate and include indigenous people in these conversations about land conservation because after all we were the ones who took care of and, and cherished truly cherished just like i can't even communicate strongly enough this feeling of love that i have for these places and to be able to have inclusion in these decisions and and just a, a voice is really really essential as well i believe as acknowledging that this land is indigenous land from Wabanaki homeland and Penobscot homeland in particular in many locations um, of these preserves. So that's a message that I'm really passionate about sharing with like-minded people who I know love, <laughs> love conservation. And, and so that's sort of where I'd like to leave this for you all to really encourage a discussion because part of um, any presentation presentation that I do in person is a lot of you know dialogue with audience because I really believe it's important to give an opportunity to discuss different um, 
different interests, something that might have sparked your curiosity. I, I really want to allow time for that. So I would welcome, welcome questions. Thank you so much, Anne. That was Thank beautiful. You. Wonderful. I, I was telling Anne when, um, when we first started communicating um, that I love her, her double curve um, art pieces. And after I learned about what that means um, and saw that in her artwork, I kept seeing it out in the natural world, in the clouds and in the trees. And um, it, was, it was super cool to learn about that. So thank you for sharing. Um, and I guess I think we'll just open it up for communicate or for questions. Um, feel yeah. free to in the chat box. And I would love to just discuss. And you know, if somebody has a question or would like me to go into a little bit more detail about what I what I already discussed, I would really really like that. Awesome. Yeah. So feel free to put your questions in the chat box or raise your little blue hand, um, and we can unmute you to uh, ask Anne directly. And I, I have a question about your, your watercolors. Are there any like palettes that you tended to gravitate towards? Like, do you find yourself like gravitating towards like cooler, like watercolors, like, like actually physically like water or like warmer, like what colors of like the sun or like, you know, earth tones, like I green really and brown. Like earth tones and trying to incorporate some of the more natural, you know, just really being inspired by the richness of the, of the main coast. It's really been incredible to be able to have access to these places that once were completely, you know, I could tell you stories, some of my elders and, and family members from the Penobscot Nation being told to go back to the reservation, that they don't belong along the coast, like just go back home. And this narrative has existed and has been prevalent up until my generation, which still experiences racism in many forms, but we have protections now um, in place to combat that. So just having access to be able to see these colors and, and to communicate that to you know, paper is, is something that, you know, it's more than words can say, for sure. Yeah. Well, the, the joy that you spoke of that you get from, you know, being in, immersed in land really comes through in your art. That's really apparent. Um, makes me want to break out the brushes it's been <laughs> absolutely years we have a and we have a couple of questions for you in the um in the chat box and i like i said before i'll just do my best to go through them in order and um and lander at any point if somebody raises their hand just let me know and we can let them let them tune in and, and talk to Anne directly um so we had a question from elise for you, Anne, and she was wondering, where does the collaboration between indigenous people and policymakers or scientists stand today in the state of Maine on issues of land conservation? That's a really great question. And I don't have all of the answers, but I can give you, you know, just from my personal experience working with land trusts, it's definitely something I think people are increasing their awareness about. There hasn't been a lot of awareness I think that in the first stages of land conservation, it was really about protecting land from development and further encroachment and, and cut off of access. So I know Blue Hill Heritage Trust was founded when a development was really threatening a large swath of land um, and the community members just came together and, and worked together to conserve it. So that's a, been a recurring theme. And I think that this is sort of the time when more interaction and acknowledgement of the indigenous voices really will become, you know, something of, you know, that's going into the future. So I'm so excited to be a part of that. I think it's such an honor to be the generation that can be here talking to you um, that you know, isn't, isn't quieted. Well put, Anne, really well put. We have um, a question from Chris asking if you could articulate your relationship with your ancestors and how you best connect with them and how does this influence your artwork? Absolutely. Hi, Chris. Thanks for your question. Um, I feel my ancestors everywhere because they're in me and their memories are alive in the places that we have loved. To have a love that is thousands and thousands and thousands of years old is a tremendous feeling of gratitude. It's humbling. It's something that 
it, it's a it's big shoes to fill because I you know my life going forward is truly devoted to preserving and educating and you know to sharing with people that this place that oftentimes indigenous people have been erased from for many 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 years we we're not erased it's in the minds of the people who, who would rather have us erased but we're still here we still love this land and and i i think it's just that connectivity that spans thousands of years is my best way to describe it and just gratitude for their survival if you could imagine all the odds being against one survival over you know centuries and centuries of, of colonization and, and the tremendous impacts that colonization has had to be able to be here is something that I am thankful for every single day. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, Diane was wondering if you had any, you know, proposals or ideas for including Indigenous people in the future of land conservation efforts. I think that's one of the most important things would be indigenous representation within land trust organizations have indigenous staff members indigenous people whose voices are prevalent and and respected and and, and heard um, so i think it really starts with creating a space for those conversations to happen and and i really think that it's an amazing place to be because we all have this love for the land and we share that connection and I think that we can only be stronger moving forward and more inclusive moving forward. Thank you, Anne. Jake, we do have one hand raised. Um, so maybe I'll take this time to allow Anne Flewelling to talk. I think you just have to unmute yourself, Anne. Okay. And I wanted to say that I was really impressed by your early motif that you described as uh, balance, because it looks also, of course, to me, and I'm sure to all Native Americans, for peoples, uh, mm -hmm. like the cross section of a canoe, mm -hmm. and that, that sense of balance. Yeah, that's really, that's a great, great observation. Um, traditionally, the double curve motif would have been used to decorate birch bark canoes. So throughout ah, history, okay. you can see that design, um, each tribe would have had a, a different take on it. And it really served as a symbol of protection as well as balance. So I think that there's balance in protection and, and those elements are, are really important. Absolutely. That's a very good point that there's balance in this protection and balance. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, the, 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 if you um, are interested in learning a little bit more about the history history of that design and just seeing some more examples of the double curve used, I would really suggest that you check out the abbeymuseum.com or .org or the Penobscot Nation Museum um, .org are, are two great resources. Um, my cousin Jennifer Neptune is a really fantastic, um, really, really, really knowledgeable, far more knowledgeable than I am about um, the designs and symbolism. Great. I've been there before, but I'll plan oh, yeah. to go back. Oh, wonderful. Did you visit the Abbey Museum or the um, Penobscot? Abbey Museum, Museum a couple of times. Wonderful. Thank you, Anne. Absolutely. Landra, I, I wonder if we could provide some links in the in the follow up email for that. Absolutely. Yes, to the um, Penobscot Nation Museum and to the Abbey Museum. I will write that down. I think that's a great I think that's a great idea. Um, Karen is interested in what program you use for your digital art, Anne. Um, I have Photoshop, so I just work with that, as well as I'm a photographer and videographer, so I use a lot of my photographs as inspiration, so I can draw, like if I wanted to go visit a really special place, I can photograph it and have like a really good image to, you know, draw from. Um, so it's definitely a multi-layered endeavor, but photography is, is something that I really, I think helps out a lot, as well as the tools like Photoshop and Illustrator. And if it seems like we don't have as, as many um, questions, I can't see the chat box, I'd be really happy to delve into the 
um, just any sort of history or places that you know I have a particular connection with that wouldn't necessarily be part of the preserves, but they're places that people can visit and really see the um, just the care that is exuded from these places that we've, we've had that balance with. Uh, one of one such place is in the area of the Blue Hill um, Peninsula, um, Brooklyn Nestkeg Point. If any of you are familiar with Nestkeg, that's a very very ancient site, and um, not only for archaeological evidence of native people, no surprise, have been there for thousands of years, but also a Norse coin was um, found there as well. So that really shows that there was a lot of um, communication going on um, throughout all different tribes. Artifacts from, you know, south um, of maybe in the Carolinas up to Newfoundland and Labrador have been found in that site. So if you can just imagine these vast trade networks that existed and, and these political systems that existed. Another extremely uh, historic place that I'm sure you're all familiar with if you've if you're from Maine or visited Maine is Castine. Uh, Castine is a really incredible place that is so rich with history, French, Dutch, um, British, and of course, indigenous history, um, all vying for control, the, the former three, um, French, Dutch, and, and British vying for control of, of this um, very small town. But what it represented was the pinnacle of trade and timber, uh, an ideal location for timber to be harvested and channeled to but um, I'm descended from the Baron de Saint Castine, who is the namesake of Castine and married uh, the revered Indian chief Madakawando's daughter. And they um, basically formed an alliance until he had to return to France in the early 1700s and never returned back to Maine. So those are two places that are really accessible to anybody who is in, in the Blue Hill region or Deer Isle region, and I would encourage you to absolutely visit. And it just shows the importance of, you know, the continual um, preservation and just looking towards making sure that these places of historical significance are, are able to be accessed for future generations. Thank you, Anne, for sharing that bonus material. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> We do have um, a bunch more questions in the chat box that maybe Jake and I will um, keep reading out and then feel free, of course, to chime in with anything else. Um, so this one is from Ellie. Uh, she says, uh, this is about land that was taken from the tribes when Europeans came here. Other nations accept payments of rent from um, we who live on your land. Would the Penobscot nations and others in Maine consider doing that? I would actually need to learn a little bit more about that. That could you repeat the name of that? Um, we who accept rent. I actually am not familiar with that, so I'd have to do a little bit more research to find out more. And I, I don't really think it, it would definitely be a, an effort of the the tribal governments in and of themselves to be making those decisions. Um, Thanks. I'd love to learn more. That sounds interesting. So I'm going to Google it and research it later on. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. Thank you. Uh, Rematriation is a concept that um, we've really been embracing. The Eastern Woodlands Rematriation Collective is an organization that has been newly formed um, by Indigenous community members. So it's born out of Indigenous communities. And we they have been working with landowners in Maine um, to who might be interested in rematriating land. So there are other avenues at this point that are just um, really getting this amazing momentum thanks to the efforts of really dedicated and incredible people. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Anne. I will include a link to the rematriation um, website or Facebook as well. Oh yes, please do. I, I really yeah. <laughs> So people can learn more. Yes. Um, we have another question from Ross Miller. Could you talk a bit more about the double curve design and other traditional motifs? Yeah, absolutely. I'm just gonna jump back to um, a few images of the watercolor so that while we're talking, we can be looking at these as well. So I'll just sort of go through them again, um, but if there was one that you're particularly interested in seeing again, we can definitely take pause. So the, the interpretation that I have of the double curve design is, is a different approach and I don't want to 
um, copy something that is really culturally specific. Um, so these are my own designs and interpretation. Um, historically, um, medicinal plants would have been depicted a lot of different, um, let's see, like, birch bark containers. I mentioned the birch bark canoes that would have been um, decorated. So it was really a great way to um, carry on the culture and these vessels that would have been used for um, maple syrup production, um, carrying, you know, for gathering. Um, but the list really goes on. And um, some other cultural symbols. Uh, I really, honestly, would have to direct you to the Abbey Museum, not because they're not, they're just so many like artifacts that would have, you know, specific styles of artifacts. It's just really incredible to be able to see them in front of you. And, and I would really encourage like further exploration. It's, it's, there's so much to discover. Thank so you. Let me just show you um, just once again the, the great horned owl. And um, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little field mouse. So that sort of talks about this balance in nature of um, the prey um, predator relationship. But in all things, there's a balance because um, the owl would never take more than the owl needs. So it's, it's a reminder that as, as humans, um, especially. Uh, colonial in colonial times more was taken than what was needed and we found ourselves in a situation where our environment is threatened and has been exploited so balance going forward will be essential and then the last is the harbor seal and the osprey thank you for your question and I'm so glad you pointed out that mouse because I, I missed it the first time we went through your slides and it is it is such an important and, and precious addition to that piece. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have some praise and then a, a question from um, Crane. Uh, thank you so much, and this is, I'm quoting, thank you so much for your grace and for sharing your art. Would you please talk about any connections you have with basket weaving in your art. Also, are you involved in language revitalization at all? Mm, those are two great questions. So I'll start with the basket making. Um, my grandmother was a basket maker, um, like completely come from a whole line of basket makers. And that's something that I haven't had the opportunity. Unfortunately, my grandmother passed when I, before I was born when my father was very young and that wasn't passed on from my family, but there are many teachers and if ever I have the opportunity within my tribe to learn from somebody who's carrying on that knowledge, I would absolutely be so, so thankful to have that opportunity. Uh, as for the, your other question regarding, could you just remind me what the um, wording of the question was? Sure it was Language revitalization, it, it's actually, it's not something that I'm familiar with either. Okay, um, but maybe so um, language revitalization, so as some of you might be aware, through um, forced, um, it's very, very, very sad, I get a bit choked up about how our language has been nearly lost and the work of so many people uh, in our tribe to preserve our languages, languages, culture, and by, by the let's see, early 1900s through the late 1900s, the last like fluent language speakers were dying out. So our elders were dying out. And because it was very, very frowned upon to teach the language and to speak the language, um, a lot of people didn't learn. So there was a gap in time when, you know, this language was still carried by very few people, but it's so hard when you're dealing with factors of, you know, extreme, po you know, poverty and, and health conditions, uh, lifespan expectancy is about 20 years shorter for Native people in Maine than it is for other people, um, non-Native people. So there's a huge disparity in so many areas that, you know, we're just trying to survive. And, and now through the work of, you know, youth and elders working together, we're able to um, revitalize our language. And I um, haven't been able to dedicate um, a lot of time to learning language, but I do know um, several words and phrases and sentences and, and plants and uh, thanks to, you know, my elders teaching me. That is 
beautiful, Anne, and I'm I'm so glad that you have that available to you when when you can and you can you can learn. I mean, that's wonderful. Um, I look forward to to diving into that a little bit more because it was something that I'm really excited to to know more about and be a positive part of. Um, Leslie has a some praise for you, Anne, and she says thanks for sharing your beautiful words and your work. Could you talk more about your family's artistic history? Um, I know that you mentioned uh, your grandmother was a basket weaver, but maybe there are some other artistic connections there as well. Um, and then she specifically yeah. was interested in um, Wabanaki art and artists. Oh yeah, that's that's a. I, I would love to give a lot of plugs, and I can definitely um, email um, both Jake and Linda some um, links to artists' websites or Instagram pages from the communities because there's so many talented artisans that I, I hate to take any credit because that my art is nowhere compared to theirs. Um, just in terms of just basketry and and jewelry making, beadwork. Um, my grandmother and great grandmother were both really incredible beaters. Um, so if you've had an opportunity to see some of the eastern woodland um, beading styles, um, they're really, really beautiful and incorporate a lot of the similar um, designs that I like to use, including the Wabanaki double curve and some different flowers and, and plants and symbolisms that um, yeah, it's just really, really incredible. So if you check out the museums, um, it wouldn't be surprising if you might see a piece that is undedicated to one of my ancestors, um, direct ancestors. But, um, and my uncle was a really, Uncle Mike, um, Mike Stock Alexis, I just call him Uncle Mike because that's <laughs> who he, he passed a long time ago. But um, I have many, many childhood memories of his incredible art. And it's just been, you know, painting. And I think that that also inspired me to become, you know, more interested in painting because I have, you know, just connection to this amazing person who did a lot of work um, in interpretation of the petroglyph sites in Matthias Fort when it was dominated by white anthropologists who would um, sort of impose their own beliefs about what these symbols meant. And he was one of the first um, about 30 years ago to really go in and say, hey, wait a minute, like, we, we, <laughs> we call this this, this is not what you say it is. Uh, so I'm really inspired by him and his work. And I really feel that sometimes when I'm in a really relaxed meditative state, I can really feel my ancestors like influencing my art and just being able to get out. And I, I can't say it enough, having access to these places that are so sacred to my entire lineage is op it's just eye-opening and really opens up these channels for art that wouldn't be there. Some pieces of art I've created that I never would have been able to even conceive without being in these places. So I really can't underscore enough the, the connectivity. Thank you for that question. <laughs> and I'll definitely get you those uh, artists and hopefully that they can be sent out in an email maybe. <laughs> Absolutely, and I would love to get those links and we will put them in the, our follow-up email to all people who have registered for this. Thank you so much. <laughs> we, have, um, we have more questions. We'll try and get through as many. Goodness, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so we have one, has your art been affected by the end of the use of Indian mascots in the end of Columbus Day? Hmm. That's, you know, Okay, I'm gonna put it in a bit of a broader context. I think my art has been impacted by the awakening of people that indigenous people are still in Maine, we're still on Turtle Island, and we're still here. And that has been exemplified through these movements. Um, Lily and Dana from the Penobscot Nation has done incredible, incredible work to um, take down these mascots and, and, and get rid of them and, and help you know, just to spread this awareness. And as well as the Indigenous Peoples Day, um, because the, the, the day that we talk about in October and not the other person. Um, it's really creating a, a channel and a comfortability to share our indigenous art and it's really inspiring to me that people are really receptive. So it's definitely sort of this receptiveness and awakening that I have uh, seen in the past decade really. Um, we tend, I think with the technology age, 
things have just progressed so quickly. But we really forget that, you know, it wasn't until the 70s um, that we were even allowed to you know, practice our religion and, and vote. And, and so many things have come so, so, so recently that, you know, my, my, my grandmother couldn't um, find work anywhere besides a shoe factory because she was told that her kind didn't belong anywhere else besides those sort of menial jobs, not to to disrespect anybody who's worked in a you know in a factory because I have utmost respect for that work and my grandfather was um, basically kicked out of college because he had a racist uh, teacher who said I'll fail you on every single one of your tests um, and, and and writing assignments and I know that you'll need this grade to continue your scholarship but I'm not going to give it to you so these are uh, these are just two stories of countless stories that have persisted until very, very recent times. And racism that I've experienced in school and in, in life. Um, so it's definitely a comfort and I'm so grateful that people are becoming more aware. Thank you for sharing those personal stories, Anne. Absolutely. We have another question. Um, at Scott's Landing, north end of Deer Isle, there is an early habitation site. Do you have thoughts about how this is interpreted and other ways of honoring that history? Oh, this is, I haven't been able to visit this site, um, and I would absolutely love to. Um, I'll write it down. Um, Scott's Landing, you said? Scott's Landing, and I think Jake probably knows more about it, but it's on the Island Heritage Trust. Okay. Yeah, it, it's a beautiful spot, and I would be, I would be so happy to go on a physical distance walk with you there if you oh, ever wanted. I would love that, Jake. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you, um, whoever pointed that out. I would love to just see see what there is to see and, and connect with that location. It's a really special place. Um, and we had a question from Carl um, about whether you're involved in the First Light Learning Journey Project. That's a great question. I actually designed the logo for a First Light Learning Project. So if you check out their webpage, you can see some of my uh, digital art uh, in, in action. <laughs> um, so I've been working with Peter Forbes of First Light for several months on that project. So I'm really excited to um, see attend virtually attend their upcoming uh, September 24th webinar, um, which will be a bunch of highly highly knowledgeable and incredible indigenous people who will be sharing their knowledge with land trust organizations um, so that's something i'm really looking forward to yeah i i would love to we i'm sure lander and i would both love to be a part of sharing that those links and all, and all of that and, and getting the word out for sure um and uh, chris is wondering if there's a way to to support and find your work online yeah, absolutely. So um, my contact information, I'll pop up on the screen. I can be reached through Instagram. My keyboard fell asleep. One moment. <laughs> Back on. Hopefully we, yes, good to go. All right. So I'm going to share my contact information. And either way is great for reaching me. So I'll just put this up here for a minute while we continue that chat. Yeah, shoot me a message. I'd love to be connected with with any and all of you who you know, have a similar passion for this this homeland and or art might be interested in art or you know a specific question about my art i'm very very happy to be connected with you thanks Anne. i hope that gave everybody enough time to jot that down who so wished <laughs> i will also share it out in our follow-up oh, thank you thank you very much yeah we have another question um let me see if I can find it now. Eh, almost lost it. Um, from Maya, could you speak a bit more about the role that art has historically played in indigenous culture and relationship to the environment? Mm -hmm. Also, this I guess is a two-part question, could you talk about the differences you see experience between the way indigenous culture approaches the environment and how Western culture approaches the environment? Okay, so the traditional traditional art and, and connectivity and how uh, Western versus an indigenous approach. So maybe we can start with that. I, I think that when people um, come up to me and talk, say, wow, you have such a connection with nature. It's really incredible. But I think everybody, everybody, everybody's ancestors shared wherever they were on this continent and, and throughout the, the world had a connection with their place at one time. And 
Native people and Indigenous people, um, as we're called, are, are somewhat unique in the fact that we've carried these traditions and connectivity for thousands of years, well, through um, colonialism and um, other historical events, those, those connections were really lost um, for a lot of other people. So I think we all had that connection. And in terms of modern day, you know, looking at you know, how Western approach, it, it, it unfortunately, environment has become so politicized. Um, so taking care of our environment, something that should come from the heart, turns into a political problem. And I don't want you know, to get into those policies and whatnot because I want to keep this light. But um, there's definitely uh, politicizing, quantifying. Uh, it's just a very, very different approach. Um, when I say all my relations, maybe some of you remembered in the introductory video, I, I said all my relations at the end. And that means all living creatures, not just humans, not just the creatures that Western civilization might deem as valuable or more worthy of life than others. To me, all life from the ant to the, the majestic eagle is equally important because when you remove one, it, it upsets the balance. <laughs> so getting back to the whole concept of balance in nature, it, it's just so important to have a very holistic approach to conservation. And the other question was a bit about, um, could you just repeat some of the primary points on it? It was about art and... Yeah. Um, could you speak a bit more about the role that art has historically played in indigenous culture and relationship to the environment? Okay, great. So I'll go back and I'll sort of go back a few generations to give a few maybe uh, anecdotal stories about um, my ancestors who would go peddling their arts um, in the tourist hotspots in the early 1900s. Um, they'd pack up their canoes and, and land on MDI and they'd set up little roadside uh, shops of sorts um, to sell their work for, you know, pet, literal pennies on the dollar um, work that, you know, nowadays would, would retail for its true value um, would have just been just for food money. So, so going back, you know, the past century, art has been a means for, you know, selling art as a means for survival. And uh, then going back before that, art to honor our ancestors, honor the environment and honor that connectivity to the environment. So uh, it went from, you know, where I am today to be able to support myself as an artist and, and be here with you all talking to just really really struggling to be like please you know like here's our art like this is what we, we create please respect us this is our homeland you're vacationing on but we can only we can't access it anymore we can only come here and sit up on the side of the road and probably get scoffed at and, and disrespected by you know 99% of the people and you might get one person who, who might be interested. And then further back in time, it really was about culture. And that's something that it's always been, culture and preservation and the environment and ancestors, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Thank you for those questions. Thank you, Anne. Jake, do you wanna ask the next one? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I'm just making sure I'm keeping in order. I think the next one came from Elizabeth. Um, and she was just kind of saying that she maybe missed the first couple of minutes. Um, and she was just wondering what a typical day in your art practice looks like. Do you have practices that you use to get ready to paint? Well, I think that creativity is something that comes very it's spontaneous for me. And it's brought about by being in nature and having a connection to these places. So uh, in the first few minutes, I showed a video of just some of the places um, in Penobscot Bay that are really incredible and inspiring. And, you know, I visited, um, perhaps you've been to Bard Island Preserve, which is um, owned by Island Heritage Trust or managed by Island Heritage Trust through the Nature Conservancy of Maine. And uh, just being able to be there, I, I, I want to be, drawing and, and painting like right now <laughs> well not right now but maybe after this I've, i'm so inspired by the beauty of that place so it's definitely spontaneous and overlapping with the adventures <laughs> and a routine would just be get the paints out sit down just be thankful to be here and and 
get to work. <laughs> nice. Thanks. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm so happy that you enjoy Bard Island the way that you do. Oh, yeah. um, Lander, we have, we have 10 minutes left, so I think we're going to do our best to get through all of the questions, but now would be a great time if anybody wa does want to raise their hand and ask Anne any questions directly um, and tune in with your audio or your video, now would, now would be a great time to do I would do love that. I so love seeing people's faces and hearing their voices. It's something I miss most about this whole virtual Zoom uh, presentation style is just not being able to have the audience right there. So I really am so thankful for you all being there, but I can't see you. <laughs> Well, okay. you've got, you still have, you have uh, over 50 people tuned in and, and um, I think they're all very happy that you're here. For now, my only audience is, is my cat in front of me, <laughs> <laughs> physically. <laughs> we do have one hand raised. Um, I, it's Ross Miller. If you would like to speak, if you have intentionally raised your hand, I'm going to allow you to talk. <laughs> Sometimes I know it's a mistake, but um, you can unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question. It's okay, Russ, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Talking's permitted, so if you'd like to ask a question, <laughs> but we'll move on um, maybe to our next chat box question for now. Um, I may be a little bit out of order here, but I, we have one um, from Elise. Can you recommend any books or resources to learn about Indigenous experiences in history in Maine? Um, mm -hmm. Also, is there anything we can do to help Indigenous people in Maine today, for example, something we can ask of our state representatives, maybe something to add to the post-webinar email. So I guess resources, um, and then uh, like to read and learn more, and then also um, something people can take action on. Okay, so it sounds like it was just really exciting. We're going to have a great email to send out to all of you with some amazing resources. So I will um, put together some resources. I think uh, an issue that has been prevalent um, throughout Wabanaki land and all over Turtle Island is whose voice is published. Um, so a lot of times it will be a white anthropologist's words that become the, the the so-called truth, when in reality, you go to those books and they, they probably would be, you know, ask a tribal member and they'd be like, what? Like my uncle Mike and the petroglyphs, just like completely differing views. Um, so one is very imaginatory coming from the, the non-native and one is steeped in culture and knowledge and thousands of years. So it's so important um, wherever you, you know, turn for resources to make sure that you're getting the source from a you know, native person and um, and not and make sure that they're coming from a place of authenticity too. There's a, a lot of scholars who um, would claim to have native heritage who don't. Um, but I will definitely get to some um, lists. <laughs> and the, the next question, if you could please remind me. See, I talk and then I forget. <laughs> but they're very good questions. It's not for the lack of appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> no. So the second part to that question um, was. Uh, is there anything we can do to help Indigenous people in Maine today, for example, something we can ask of our state representatives? That is a great question. I would definitely encourage you to um, communicate with the, the tribe um, because a lot of times in history, uh, movements haven't been originated from the tribe themselves. It's been sort of an imposition like, oh, you need this, you need this. But I think it's really important to respect the voices of Indigenous people. So it would be supporting um, collectives like the Eastern Woodlands Rematriation Collective and other Indigenous-led organizations who are doing this work and, and taking either a backseat role, contributing um, through you know financial support. Um, so at this time, I would definitely ask you to look towards these organizations that are already doing work and and just see where you can help if there is a need. That's awesome, man. Something that came to mind when you were talking was um, in terms of like resources and more like further learning, um, you, you must be familiar with um, Maine Wabanaki Reach and the programs of that cross-cultural collaboration. And um, I've found that I've, I've learned a lot through their programs and workshops. So if maybe yes. perhaps the participants want to learn more, they could look into taking a workshop. Yeah, I actually sat in on one of the workshops and it's really, I won't give any spoilers, but you know, a lot of people were in tears and, and really having these epiphanies of 
understanding. So I would definitely encourage you. I don't know if they're having any virtual uh, workshops, but that would be something to check out for sure. So, um, Anne, you have some some additional praise from Cran, um, and then <laughs> just a a note that the um, Western Abenaki may have basket making programs that could potentially be available after the time of COVID, mm -hmm. um, whenever that may be. So that might be something that would be us all looking into is how we can support that program, the programming, and and also share the knowledge of that beautiful um, art. And then I think you, uh, and then from Carl, um, Carl said that I think, I don't know, ex I forget what he was referencing to, but he said that he would be there representing Western Foothills Land Trust. I think, Anne, you were speaking of on the 24th, there was going to be, yeah, right, exactly. Okay. So Carl will, will be there. So Carl will, will all of us will, who can, will turn in. Excellent. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody would like to, you know, reach out to the email. I'd love to hear about your connection. Just because we can't really have a dialogue and discussion here and now, um, if you'd like to share your connection to any of these places or recommend places um, where I can access the coast, um, places that I might not know about, I would really appreciate that. So I really encourage reaching out. And and we have a, a, a bit more praise for you before we say goodbye. I, this has been wonderful. But um, Elizabeth just said, thank you for your dedication to your art and for carrying precious indigenous ways. I'm grateful that you are willing to share and be straight with your heart. So that's, oh, I'm sorry. And the share and it goes straight to your heart. Oh, thank you. And that was from um, Diane, too, I think. Oh, no, I'm sorry. There's another one. Um, and then I think we're just about on time. So Diane tuned in. She said, perhaps each of us can reach out to our local land conservation organizations and ask that indigenous voices be specifically invited to join to speak. I think that's a wonderful idea. Any, any involvement that we can include and, and raise up would be wonderful. That's a great idea. Diane and, and Anne, if you have anything to add to that, please. Yeah, absolutely. It's been, I think that um, the first light gathering uh, upcoming will be a really incredible and eye opening experience for a lot of land trusts, or just to affirm directions that land trusts are headed in in terms of inclusivity of Native people. But um, for all of you who have enjoyed and had pleasure in walking or you know, visiting the coastline, really to just communicate that to the land trusts and say, hey, you know, this is indigenous land, whether it be like having signage, um, Maine Coast Heritage Trust in um, their preserves oftentimes have signage just talking about the importance of the archaeological history of, of that place. Um, just off the top of my head, Long Point Preserve in Machiasport and Witherly Woods in Castine are two places that I've been within the past week, um, two favorite places of mine um, that really have that signage. It's really, really nice to be an Indigenous person and see that somebody's acknowledging they might not be there to acknowledge it, but there's something there to acknowledge the land is indigenous land. And I have, I guess I have one final question. That okay. kind of off of that okay. one. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on, on land acknowledgements? If, if there is a person there running a program on the land, um, what are your thoughts about that kind of spoken acknowledgement? Okay, I'll try to, I know we don't have much time but I'll try to um, quickly answer it. So in terms of land acknowledgement, just having some sort of signage, Penobscot language signage or Passamaquoddy language signage or whoever is land, the land trust is occupying. Um, so that would be, you know, Carol, I know you are familiar with Carol Dana, who's one of our language keepers and she's been such an incredible mentor to me and I have so much love for her and her knowledge. Um, she's done a lot of signage um, for, for Erickson Fields Preserve in um, Rockport. So that would be another Maine Coast Heritage Trust um, Preserve. Um, so just inclusivity, um, inclusivity. And she'll also be creating signs or is in the process of creating signs for Bangor Land Trust as well throughout their preserves. So by native people in the native voice. <laughs> That was longer than, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Thank you so much. And we're just at 5 p.m. now. And uh, we have enjoyed this so, so much, Anne. Oh. We're so grateful 
for you taking some time out of your your day to to talk to us and share everything that you've shared with us tonight. I'm so grateful and thank you for giving me this platform to to share. So I really appreciate it and thank you all for being here. Absolutely. We have um we have some more thank yous. I'll just quickly read them out. Um, Elizabeth says, please come down to Cape Porpoisan. I would love to advocate for signage and land acknowledgement in Cape Porpoise. I think that's how you pronounce it. I will connect with you on Instagram to send an invite. <laughs> I look forward to that. <laughs> Fabulous. And then just many more thank yous. Aww. Thank you so much. Love your art. Aww. So I think this is well, all. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, and, and we say in Penobscot, could you Willy Winnie, which means many thanks. Willy Winnie, thank you. And could you? Many. So could you Willy Winnie? <laughs> Many thanks to you, Anne. I, I so like this was truly the highlight of my day, and I look forward to more learning. So I hope we can engage and and um, continue this effort. As do I. As do I. Have a wonderful night, Anne. And thank you. Yeah. you all as well. Thank you. Enjoy the beautiful evening. <laughs> thank Take you care. both. Be well. <laughs>